uh, another uh, topic uh, regarding effect snow. Again, sort of like the previous one, uh, not hasn't been well well documented in the literature. It's certainly a forecast problem we dealt with for a long time, but it I don't think it's really been tackled uh, systematically. And this is the trying to determine uh, the extent of more significant uh, effect snow. Uh, with these with these banded features, and Joe Villani, a forecaster at the Albany uh, New York office, and I have been have been working on this for uh, for a while now as well. A quick outline. Uh, I'll go over some of the goals of why we started this work, our, our methodology, and some of our uh, initial results. Um, with a, a, a Forecast uh, application that's currently uh, you can use on the AWIPS, which is uh, the workstations that the NWS uses. Uh, we've been looking at uh, more recently with our work and, and maybe what we can accomplish in the future. Okay, so uh, the obvious goal here is we wanted to pull out the most influential atmospheric ingredients promote greater inland extent of significant lake effect snow. And again, uh, use this information to somehow formulate uh, a predictive technique that we could use real time. So analogy, um, what Joe and I have done combined, uh, I have looked at uh, many lake effect snow events in, in the time period outlined here over the central part of New York. Uh, Joe has looked at um, events in his area more in the eastern part of the state. Uh, it over a period of, of about four winters, and the basic idea was for any given event, we have a number of points any one of the given uh, four synoptic times, again, that we're, we pick several points for each of these time frames inside the band at this time and just outside of the band. Uh, we incorporated some 0 and 12Z soundings uh, if it was the right time and the band was close enough. Uh, we used a lot of 12-kilometer NAM initial hour uh, sounding data as well to help us with the different parameters. This pictorially represents what I just said. Uh, for this particular radar snapshot, the uh, light blue colored dots is maybe what we would have typically picked. You saw here four points were picked right down the band center line or maybe just downwind. We would pick a few points typically north or south of the band if it was oriented in an east-west fashion like this one was. And at the right time, we try to incorporate some buffalo in Albany data. And this is a cross-section of the atmospheric parameters, um, a lot kind of based on, on forecast experience, uh, some of it on prior write-ups, that we had a, a reasonable idea they have a, a fair influence on, on the inland extent of lake effect snow band. We looked at a lot of um, wind flow, some wind flow parameters in the mix layer. Common conventional thinking is that stronger flow environments would promote greater limit extent. We wanted to get parameters to show how moist uh, the mix layer environment is. We did things like a width and length of the snow bands, uh, stability classes, how high the capping inversion was some convergence, uh, and we looked for some um, uh, data to indicate, too, if uh, multi-lake uh, influences upstream were effective. Okay, and here's how some of the correlations and some of the results uh, are worked out for the uh, several years of data that we looked at. 
If you can see up near the top of this slide, the, uh, the numbers in parentheses were correlations that uh, calculated for his events in the Albany uh, forest area where the bracketed numbers were uh, conditions for uh, lake effect events that affected the uh, Binghamton, New York forecast area. And I tried to uh, show some of the better correlations from top to bottom. It seems the winner here was uh, existence of a multi-lake connection upstream. And again, this is not, uh, this finding I think is fairly intuitive. If you've got a number of upstream lakes contributing to uh, the, uh, the moisture depth that the band has access to over time, um, it would seem reasonable that that could potentially promote greater inland extent. Uh, relations were fairly high. Um, just using a simple yes and no convention, was there a, a upstream lake involved or not? Correlations were fairly high for both forecast areas. Interestingly, um, fairly negative correlations came out for the uh, the differential between the 850 millibar temperature and the water temperature. So in other words, these strongly negative correlations seem to imply that as opposed to events that had extreme instability, it's the events that were more either in the conditional or the moderate range based on Isiel's analysis um, that he originally documented back in the late 80s. The conditional to moderate uh, was better for promoting inland extent than the more extreme unstable cases, at least based on the events that, that we had looked at. Um, capping inversion heights, a fairly significant positive correlation um, in, in um, all the past area, at least, for uh, a deeper mixed layer seemed to promote inland extent, again, presumably access to maybe greater moisture depths. Um, we talked about before kind of the conventional forecaster thinking was that th this had a lot to do with strong winds. Certainly, as you can see, the speed shear in the lowest kilometer, the correlations are fairly significant. Uh, stronger flow in the uh, lowest kilometer greater inland extent, but some of the other correlations were a little stronger than the wind. So I, I think this demonstrates that it's, that it's not quite that simple, that it only comes down to stronger wind is going to equal a deeper inland penetration. So the bottom here is based on these results. It seems like situations where you have a lake-to-lake -lake influence, an indicated uh, mixed layer, perhaps um, over instability that's more in the conditional to moderate range versus extreme and on wind flow in the lowest kilometer seems to equal events where your bands penetrate farther inland. And I have a type A here annotated on the bottom. I'm going to, going to show you what I mean by that here in just a second. So basically, we, we kind of tried to separate events that seem to favor greater inland extent versus ones that, that would more obviously favor um, much more shallow uh, or smaller inland extent inland from the shoreline. The favorable cases, the real long instead things we call type A, these where the bands did not extend very far inland from the shore we call type B. These are, this is just an example sounding and the corresponding radar image from one of our type A events. Uh, the elevated capping inversion in these cases up around three kilometers AGL. You can see that most of the speed here was concentrated in the lowest kilometer versus up. And I glossed over in the previous slide the relatively poor correlation between zero to three kilometer speed here and inland extent. So uh, much better correlation in the lowest kilometer, and this, this event certainly seemed to bear that out. And corresponding radar image uh, 
west-southwest flow case off of Lake Ontario where the band uh, looked like went uh, well into Passiat or Adirondacks and uh, almost to Vermont at this particular time. And here's an example of Type B, uh, a, lake effect a lake effect band which stayed pretty close to the shoreline. A significant snow did not extend very far inland. Uh, in this particular case, you can see the height of the capping inversion more shallow, two kilometers. Uh, you can see the speed shear in the lowest kilometer, much weaker in this case. Um, and of course, the radar image showing kind of a, a diffuse looking band that uh, maybe went 40 to 45 miles as the crow flies inland from the line. Okay, and uh, this is another uh, more recent uh, Type B example, kind of a, uh, not the, uh, much of an inland extent. This was from this past January. And here's uh, an initial snapshot of our, um, our inland extent forecast application that we came up with. And you can see the application did very well in this event um, using a distance measuring tool for the radar on the left. It, I think it measured there 34 nautical miles on the shoreline uh, inland to uh, where the more significant returns where the band seems to run out based on radar and satellite. And the, uh, the number may be tough to see there, but I believe the inland extent application at that time was estimating about 31 or 32 miles. So uh, it, it really did a very good job in this case. And Joe and I have, have noticed over time, the majority of the time, there are certain cases where you would expect it maybe to have some problems. I'll go over that a little bit later, but most of the time, this Test bed cases we've looked at, it's done, it's very well. Uh, and this looks a little bit more closely at the uh, how the app, what the application looks like. Basically, the statistics and the equations we just talked about, we pulled it down to a multi element regression equation. Basically, what feeds the final answer here, the inland extent that it comes up with in nautical miles. And it should be pointed out that uh, application right now, it's kind of specifically calibrated for Lake Ontario. We really haven't um, delved into looking at other parts of the Great Lakes region or different lakes yet. Um, that's certainly, I think, something where this work has a lot of potential, but we haven't done that yet. So, uh, again, a quick summary of some of our initial results. We looked at uh, lake effect snow events, uh, basically downwind from Lake Ontario, the eastern parts of New York. For the most part, for the cases that affected the Albany area, they were your single band cases, your, your kind of west to northwest flow, 250 to 280 degree uh, mean wind vectors. And this app, our uh, in extent application performed very, very well in these cases. Um, it usually was within about 10 to 20 nautical miles at any given time of the inland extent based on radar and satellite. Um, for your cases where you had real anomalously long bands that went um, well over 100 miles inland, it tended to underestimate some for those. Your northwest flow events, your 290 to 300, your 330 degree mean flow, um, or we had a mixture of single bands and multi bands. It still did reasonably well most of the time, but there were definitely times where it underestimated rather significantly for those cases. And we're going to go into that a little bit here. It, 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 it uh, triggered us to kind of look at for the events where it underestimated uh, what are the sources of the error? And it seemed that maybe just a simple toggle yes-no from multi-lake connection, since it was our strongest correlator, uh, maybe that wasn't quite good enough. So how would we go, how would we improve it from there? So 
up with this term of uh, effective fetch, and basically it tries to represent kind of the additive effect of free moisture contributions as opposed to a simple uh, yes or no. And here's an example again of our Inlet Extend application, and I have highlighted in a dark blue rectangle here, as opposed to a simple yes, no now, uh, for our output for Lake Ontario, we have a number of choices for a, kind of a drop down, a pull down. We could choose maybe just Georgian Bay was an upstream, um, uh, was an upstream lake involved. Was it more than one? Like in this case, uh, Lake Huron and Superior were involved, or, or maybe just Huron in other cases. So. Um, just quick, you have your choice of model, looks at the NAM or the GFS. We have a number of kind of built-in locations that you could pick uh, based on uh, Lake Ontario events. And then the features on the right, they are automated um, that the uh, application reads off of uh, AWIP slant uh, bucket data. I'm going to show an example here. I thought it was interesting that uh, one of the previous speakers, he talked about a heavy lake effect snow event in December of 2010 in Ontario. We had, during those same days, we had uh, fairly big events in our forecast area also, especially around the Syracuse area. Uh, this particular event, you can see I, I put the distance measuring tool the, uh, the radar mosaic and significant snow from this Lake Ontario band went well the capital district in Albany and even into the Berkshires and Western Mass. Uh, I believe the extent is uh, about 180 miles in this case, so uh, anomalously long uh, inland penetrations in this case. The inland application didn't do so well. It only estimated about 80 nautical miles at this time, where in reality it was more than 100 miles farther than that. Now, the output was based on the original um, terms of the equation. If you look at a visible satellite picture at the time, it's pretty easy to tell that a uh, nice input moisture wise from both Georgian Bay, uh, up, well, in this particular case, from Georgian Bay upstream. You know, quite a fetch too over portions of Lake Ontario itself. So, um, what add the um, kind of additive fetch term post analysis sense into the inland extent application? We went ahead and added that. So, if you were able to have added the choice of uh, adding Georgian Bay in this case, the uh, output was improved. It's still underestimated. But it certainly did better than the original. And we that triggered us to do the same for some of the other events. Pretty consistently across the board, uh, the results did improve where they were. The underestimate wasn't quite as much, or the uh, difference itself was just uh, much closer to the truth. Anticipating multi-lake connection is not necessarily the most intuitive thing in forecast mode. Uh, so what tools could be used to help a forecaster in that regard? Just a few I'll quickly address here. Uh, trajectory analyses, uh, perhaps using some sort of analog or composite system. And uh, we talked a little bit earlier the last presentation about uh, high-resolution models, some of the stated reflectivity products perhaps could be used. Factories is something that we started using more in our office here um, in a forecast mode for late effect events, uh, trying to see where the model uh, casting uh, wind flow and what kind of orientation and trajectory across a uh, particular lake surface and where it goes from there. Uh, that, that, that certainly could be one tool to help uh, forecast mode. 
But uh, what Joe did in Albany for some of his events, too, is he looked at some uh, synoptic uh, composite plots, looking at different levels like 80 millibar uh, pressures and wind flow and that kind of thing. Um, and you could conceivably use that, and, and Joe did use it to sort of stratify a high flow regime or type of event, maybe for, uh, say, a 300-degree fetch, for instance, that had deep inland penetration, your surface uh, features tended to look like this, your 850 millibar features tended to look like that, or, or vice versa for cases where it didn't go very far inland. That could potentially be a, a tool to use in this regard. Uh, where we go from here, uh, as far as the inland extent application, I think it's a really good start operationally. Uh, it seems to show some promise. Uh, it's worked at least for some eastern Great Lakes events off of Lake Ontario. But we're trying to work to add a graphical component. I think one of the, the uh, maybe the, the limitations right now, it's a little bit black box-ish. Uh, it kind of reads some, some automated parameters and then it cranks out a number. I think it would be interesting like if we could add uh, looking at a map and maybe for different flow vectors you could you could graphically see how far inland the application was forecasting uh, the lake band to go with, with county outlines on the background or something. I think that could be good for, uh, for forecasters. And I touched on it briefly before. Certainly, I think this has potential to be adapted to other portions of the Great Lakes region. Would the parameters, with the exact same parameters and same correlations apply to other regions and other lakes versus Ontario? I'm really not sure. Um, I, I don't have a reason to believe that the uh, kind of the physics here would be horribly different area to area, but different maybe to the coastline and, and other things like that, that may be in a relative sense the prioritization of some of these parameters could be different in different parts of the Great Lakes region. I think there's a potential here maybe to use a similar methodology for other places to explore um, building a tool uh, for, for your specific area. Again, um, we haven't looked a great deal yet for how well the high-resolution models do with simulating inland extent in the future. I'd say anecdotally again, I think in the cases where they've gone very far inland, I've looked at a few cases, gone back and look at the uh, simulator reflectivity and like inland extent application, it, it, it tended to be underdone. But I have looked at enough yet to make fast assumptions. That is all we have. So again, um, I'll enter questions. Hey Mike, this is Justin in Gaylord. Um, I wonder if, if one of the things that you might be able to, to look at your way, you have a little bit more terrain than we do out in, the, um, out in Michigan here. If um, some of the, the reasoning behind some of those bands penetrating further into New York and some that don't just be maybe just a result of just how much terrain they run into as they come inland. I mean, some of those all bands, you know, they kind of sneak down the Mohawk Valley and, and, and kind of curve down into Albany. You know, I, I wonder if just, much, you know, how much topography they, they encounter, you know, whether they hit the Tug Hill or not has, you know, has, plays any role. It's an interesting parameter to look at. Justin, I think certainly in the cases that go into the Capital District, I think it's not that unusual for the band to follow kind of the, uh, the lay of the land, to follow the Mohawk Valley. I've certainly seen cases where um, deep trading bands kind of, kind of go over some, some terrain features, some uh, different uh, uh, mountain ranges there where I necessarily think it would, but I, but I think your point's well taken about um, assessing the terrain to see how much of a factor that plays. Hi, Dove Ben Simon from the Canadian Med Center in Montreal. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. It's always nice to see some really uh, handy um, uh, tools that you can use on the desk. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'm, uh, I'm amazed the amount of work that has gone 
this. Is it yourself that developed the whole uh, interface, or do you have help from the informatics section to do this? Uh, I'm just wondering what the workflow is like. Thank you. The help. And as a matter of fact, uh, Joe in, in in Albany, he probably he he had well definitely he had more of a hand in the um, physical construction of the application than I did. And uh, he had some people, I believe, uh, from from Albany, from the department, helping him on on um, as well. We did a lot of the initial work with uh, coming up with the parameters to feed the application, but certainly had help with uh, building that. And then uh, the uh, ITO, the uh, information technology people that we have here in Binghamton and Albany, have, have helped us in the meantime, kind of maintain it and help us get some graphical capability. Okay, nice, uh, nice teamwork again then. Thank you. Last question for Michael. Uh, 